Today we're going to talk about having the hard talks, and I think just in light of all we've heard, I mean, my heart's heavy. I think of our sister Emma, where she is. I think of, you know, our brother Brandon and just the scare. Life is short, and the gospel is good news, so let's get on with it. You know, let's tell the truth and look people in the eye and tell them what they need to hear. Jesus came to save sinners. In my undergraduate degree, I, um, I studied at Heritage. My undergraduate degree was in music, and I had one professor who was a nightmare. Uh, he was Dougie T. He hated being called Dougie T, which is probably part of why it was such a nightmare. Um, but he pushed me. Uh, he really pushed me. And you've, maybe you've had a teacher like that. He said all the hard stuff. He, uh, it really bothered him when I settled for anything less than my best and uh, pushed me to the point of tears, which obviously is not surprising as of today. But uh, it pushed me to the point of tears on more occasions than I'd like to admit. Uh, but as he did that, I knew, I knew that he cared. I knew that he cared. There wasn't, a, there wasn't any question in my mind. Nobody celebrated louder when I succeeded. Nobody was happier when I reached my potential. Uh, he pushed because he cared. And he taught me this valuable lesson that, that I'll never forget. He told me, practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And that really stuck in my head. Practice doesn't make perfect. You could practice for eight hours a day for the rest of your life, but if you're practicing with unhelpful bad habits... You're going to play with unhelpful, bad habits. So we had the hard talks, and he rooted all that stuff out because he wanted to set me on a trajectory for success, and that's true in music, that's true in sports, that's true in work, that's true in life. The bad habits that we indulge in today, the bad patterns that we embrace today set us on a trajectory, and it's like a ship at sea that goes off course, you know, two meters which doesn't make much of a difference right now, but by the time they get to the end destination, they're 100 miles from where they want to be. They're shipwrecked. Hard talks matter. We need to speak the truth. Correction is mercy, contrary to how it feels in the moment. Rebuke is love. A famous Puritan once wrote, although my patients might become angry when I probe their infected wounds, they'll thank me when they recover. If I'm afraid to tell people about their sins, I murder their souls. When we're too afraid to say the things that need to be said, when we compromise on the truth and make peace with sin, that's what's at stake. We murder souls. Do you believe that? Evidently, the Apostle Paul did, which is why he wrote the text we have in front of us. Uh, look with me, if you haven't already, to 1 Timothy chapter 1, which is right near the end of your New Testament, if you're searching for that. 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to be reading from verses 18 to 20. Hear now God's holy, inspired, inerrant, that means without error, living and active word to us today. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith, And a good conscience, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy. Well, what is this charge that he's referring to? Well, he's pointing back to the charge that we found at the opening of the letter. You can see that if you look back at verse 3 and 4. He says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. Why? So that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. So Paul's writing to young Pastor Timothy, and he's reminding him that pastoral ministry is not for the faint at heart. It's going to be tough Timothy, I'm sending you into the lion's den here. You're going to have to have some really hard talks. And Timothy, you're going to be tempted to soften off all the sharp edges. You're going to be tempted to bite your tongue. But you can't. Because there's too much at stake. You need to tell the truth. You need to wage the good warfare, Timothy. See, the devil was gaining a foothold in Ephesus. This church that had started strong. And I talked uh, in the first week how this church in Ephesus reminds me so much of our own in that they had, they had launched well, they'd started strong, they were so well equipped, and yet a good start doesn't guarantee a good finish. And this church in Ephesus was, was on the path to shipwreck and ruin. 
And so Paul was sending Timothy to have the hard talks that no one else was courageous enough to have, to say the things that needed to be said. Therefore, in our passage this morning, he's preparing Timothy to wage the good warfare. The good warfare, which is speaking the truth to these people who are wandering. So how do you do that? How do you prepare to wage the good warfare? Well, first, Paul tells Timothy, remember who sent you. We see that in verse 18. Paul writes, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So here Paul is pointing Timothy's memory back to this event of his commissioning, of these prophecies that were made about him. Unfortunately, we, we don't have a record of this scene. Every once in a while, Paul points to something, and we find it in the book of Acts, and that's helpful. Uh, here he's pointing to something, and we don't, we don't have it. We can't see it. But prophecies were made. So perhaps you can envision the Apostle Paul, who's got, you know, he just has a word from the Lord, and he says, Timothy, you're being set apart to go to the church in Ephesus. You're being set apart to bring this church back on track. Or maybe it was the, the church that Timothy had been a part of before this, and they had come and they laid hands on him and said, Timothy, we feel that God is sending you to Ephesus. We don't know. This is all speculation. Somebody at some point had these prophecies that they made about Timothy to commission him. And at risk of reading our own way of doing things into the text, I think it might be helpful to share a bit of my commissioning, just so you can maybe see this in your mind's eye. Right? Why would Paul point Timothy back to this? Well, I remember when we launched Redeemer, and you remember, Pastor Paul was preaching here and at Cornerstone every week. And we reached a point where we all knew that this is not sustainable. He's going to burn out. Uh, it's just not the best way forward. And so they began to look for a new pastor who would, who would kind of take over, who would receive the baton. And there was lots of prayer and lots of discernment. And they reached a point where they were coming to a decision. And so we had our January board retreat. And we went up to NBC. And they excused all of the staff from the room. And those elders stayed and they prayed. And then an elder came out. And he said, Levi, come in. And I came in, and I sat in a chair in the middle of the room, and I still remember these 10 men standing around me, and they laid hands on me, and they prayed for me. And they said, Levi, we feel like God is calling you to this assignment. And that was a very special moment for me. And I look back on that some days when I wonder, is, is, is this where I'm supposed to be? Surely somebody else. And I remember, no, no, God spoke through those men, and he sent me here. In the same way, though not exactly the same, Paul is telling Timothy to remember Remember that you didn't put yourself here, young man. Remember that you didn't force your way to the front of the line in Ephesus. We sent you. We sent you because God sent you. God spoke and he commissioned, and this assignment is for you, Timothy. Therefore, if God sent you, he'll give you what you need, Timothy. Therefore, if God sent you, you can't waver on this. You can't pull back on the message that you need to share. That's what he's doing. He's encouraging him. He's emboldening him. As one commentator notes, Timothy is solemnly reminded that the ministry is not a matter to be trifled with, right? It's not as if, do I want to keep playing on the basketball team or do I want to quit? No, this is an order from the commander-in-chief. God sent him. And so if Timothy's going to pick up this assignment, if he's going to wage the good warfare, he needs to remember who sent him. Second, Paul tells Timothy, if you're going to wage this good warfare, you need to guard your belief and your behavior. We see that in verse 19. He tells him, wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. See, so as Timothy goes into this church, and again, there's, there's bad theology, there's bad behavior, there's, it's a mess. And as Timothy goes to confront that hypocrisy in the church, it's very important that he is not living like a hypocrite himself. Right? It's intuitive. Now, to be clear, Timothy wasn't living like a hypocrite. But Paul wanted to understand, he wanted to make sure that Timothy understood how important this was. He wanted him to see the stakes. That if Timothy succumbs to this bad belief and bad behavior, if Timothy regresses into this sin, there will be huge consequences. The restoration mission will be a failure. The church will collapse. When pastors fall, there are serious consequences. And so Paul speaks to young Timothy and he says, you guard it. You hold fast to faith and a good conscience, young man. Because the primary pastoral battle is the personal battle for holiness. To be a pastor, to be an elder, to be an overseer is to bring yourself into submission and then to call others to join you. Now that's true for pastoring, but listen, that's also true for parenting, isn't it? All right, so don't say, oh, this is good for you, pastor. No, this, you need to hear this too. The day will surely come when your child will want to go down a sinful path. 
and, and you're looking at, at what they're about to do, and you know that the, the end result of this is heartache and destruction and ruin. So here's a question. Are you positioning yourself to be in a place of influence when that day comes? Hear this. If you are living like a hypocrite today, you are surrendering your influence for tomorrow. That's hard, but that's true. Right? If, if they are watching you make peace with sin, if, you're, if your style of leadership in the home is do as I say, but not as I do, son, you're going to have no influence when the day comes, when that boy needs to hear from someone. Guard your faith. Guard your good conscience. Let them see a slow and steady growth in holiness in your life. Let them see you confronted with sin and repenting. Make that repentance out loud. Tell, I, I had to confess this week to my son that I had just given away to, to my anger, and I, it was a bad example, and I had to repent. And it's humbling to repent to a six-year-old, but it was needed. Seven now. Not as humbling. No, it was, ne- it was needed. And our kids need to see that from us, right? We model that as pastors, as parents, as mentors. And that's what Timothy's being called to here. He's being called to set a good example in word and deed in the household of God as he corrects these teachers who've wandered into sin. And so how do you do that? How do you guard your belief and your behavior? Paul says you hold fast to faith. So I mentioned earlier that he's, he's alluding back to this early charge in the letter. And in that early charge, if, if you remember, if you were with us, he talked about how there was this false doctrine being taught. And his job was to get them back to the true doctrine. So when he says faith here, he's encompassing all of the true doctrine. John Calvin says the same thing. He says, I understand the word faith to be a general term denoting sound doctrine. So, meaning the false teachers in Ephesus had grown bored with the old, old gospel story. And so they were trying to entertain themselves with myths and genealogies and foolishness and nonsense. And so Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, don't have any of that, Timothy. You need to, to hold fast to the gospel. You need to preach Christ and him crucified. Preach it to them. Preach it to yourself. That's our message, right? Don't get pulled into anything else. Don't get pulled into the novelty. You hold fast to the truth. That's what they need. That's what you need. Hold fast to faith. And then second, hold to a good conscience. Now, what does that mean? Well, your conscience, and if maybe you've never been to church before, you probably know what a conscience is though, right? Imagine it like a lane assist alarm in your heart. It's like God put this thing in there. And when you start going out of the lane, all of a sudden it starts beeping and beeping, and so you get back in the lane. What happens if you ignore the beeping? Well, eventually you run into another car or a tree, right? You ignore the beeping to your own peril. And Paul says here, you've got to hold fast to that good conscience. You listen real close as your conscience starts to fire off in your heart and in your mind. We ignore that alarm when we indulge in habitual sin. So maybe there are some people here today who even right now the alarm is going off as I'm speaking because you know there's some things in your life that you've made peace with. They're wrong. That means that you are not holding fast to a good conscience. If that alarm's going off, you're not there. You ignore that alarm when you make peace with things that you know are wrong. Right? Wrong, wrong behavior, wrong, wrong things that you're cultivating in your heart. To hold fast to a good conscience then is to live a life of obedience to God's word. It is to respond. Whenever he says something that's contrary to, to your life, your convictions, you humble yourself, you submit. That's what it means to hold fast to a good conscience, to practice what you preach. And so if Timothy's going to wage the good warfare, he has to guard his belief, he has to guard his behavior. And then finally, in preparation for this assignment, Paul tells him, Timothy, don't assume that you're immune. Now this is important. Look at verse 20. It says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now before we can go further, I feel like I probably should address what it means to hand someone over to Satan. Because I've read this passage a hundred times, but I imagine if you're hearing it for the first time, that is probably sending off some alarms. What does it mean to hand someone over to Satan? Well, this is a, a term that the Apostle Paul frequently uses when he refers to church discipline. Church discipline is to put a person outside of the church. So it is to publicly say that this person is not a Christian. Their life give ev- gives evidence to the fact, their, their uh, non-repentance on this issue gives evidence to the fact that they are not a Christian. And it's to publicly say they are not of us. So that's what church discipline is. 
And Paul uses this language of giving them over to Satan elsewhere. In 1 Corinthians 5, for example, he uses this language. Um, some of you are familiar with that story. Some of you aren't. The church in Corinth had a man in their midst, and this man w- was guilty of sexual sin. In fact, he was engaging uh, sexually with his father's wife. And we don't think it was his actual mother. We think his father had remarried. But still, it, this was wicked. This was evil. Even the culture knew, like, this is wrong. And yet the church in Corinth, rather than addressing the sin, they made peace with it. And in fact, they thought it was pretty impressive that they'd made peace with it. They thought, look how loving we are. You know, this guy's doing this gross thing, and he's still welcome here. This is, we're really wonderful. And the Apostle Paul didn't share that sentiment. He wrote to them in 1 Corinthians 5, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So that's what the discipline is. Let him be cast out of the church. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, the destruction of the flesh, he's not talking about his physical body. Paul is contrasting the flesh, which is our sinful desires, and the spirit, which is what God has called us to. So you you put him outside of the church to put those sinful desires to death so that his spirit may be saved. So to excommunicate a person is to publicly put them outside of the church. But maybe you've never thought about this, and you're wondering, why on earth would you do that? What is wrong with you people? That is a, you guys are so intense. You're so crazy. Here's the thing. We put people outside of the church because we love. Because we love them. Because we love the church community. And because we love the community at large. It is dangerous when you have people who are pretending to be Christians, claiming to be Christians, but who are evidently, obviously not Christians. One commentator notes, the greatest injury done by wicked men is when they mingle with others under the presence of holding the same faith. It's dangerous. I mean, we as a culture know this. We've, we've been grieving over all of the sexual abuse scandals, all these horrible things that happened in the church. And you say, how did that ever happen? It happened because of this. Because we're too cowardly to have the hard talks. Because we see evidence and signs of sin and patterns of, of behavior that Jesus is not the Lord of this person's life and yet we make them elders, and we make them deacons, and we put them on committees, and people get hurt. People in the church get hurt, men and women, boys and girls. Trust betrayed, uh, led off by wolves into ruin. People in the community get hurt, right? Because people in the community see, see these people going around saying, I represent Christ, but their life looks nothing like Jesus, and so people in the community want nothing to do with Jesus. But in reality, Jesus is amazing. It's just that person is a hypocrite. And someone should have said something. But, but here's the piece that we often fail to consider. It's also unloving to the person who needs to be disciplined. It's unloving. They need someone to tell them that they're deceived. They need someone to tell them that they're on the road to ruin. They need someone like my professor to, to grab them and say, the habits, the patterns that you have here are going to lead you to ruin, so stop it. They need that. That's what we see in the text. What is the purpose of discipline? The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, He says, cast them outside the church. Why? That they may learn not to blaspheme because that's going to lead to their eternal ruin. In 1 Corinthians 5, he says, cast them out of the church. Why? So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, we have the benefit of history, and we know that the gentleman in 1 Timothy who was disciplined never repented. At least there's no account of it in Scripture. He just went further into ruin. And yet we have evidence that the man from 1 Corinthians 5 did repent, and he was restored to the church. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, and he says, hey, he's repented. Bring him back in. There is grace and mercy for everyone, especially for this man. Bring him back into the fold. And so this, we see that church discipline actually does restore people to the faith. One commentator notes, however stringent the process, the motive was mercy. And whenever ecclesiastical, that is church, whenever church discipline has departed from this process of restoration, its harshness has proved a barrier to progress. Meaning, our correction must always be delivered from a place of sincere love with a motive of mercy. But that's not actually the point of the verse, and that was a long segue, but it's 
Here's the point of the verse. It's Paul's not telling Timothy to put these men under discipline. They've already been placed under discipline. What's he telling him? Paul is telling him to see these men. He's saying, Timothy, look at them. Learn the lesson from their lives. Be humble. See, one of God's purposes in discipline is to wake us up to the dangerous consequences of sin. It's to remind us that, that we could just as easily fall into ruin. See, Paul says the same thing in his letter to the Galatians. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. In a spirit of gentleness, again, it's always consistent. Have the hard talk, do it in a spirit of gentleness, but then listen, he follows up and he says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. See, over the last few years, we've experienced scandals in the church, and you're not oblivious to these. Um, the Ravi Zacharias scandal rocked us. Um, it devastated, I know for some of you, really deeply devastated you. My father read every Ravi Zacharias book, went to every Arzim conference. We were devastated by that. The, the Mark Driscoll fall has been widely publicized. We're seeing all of these things, and, and it's horrible, and it, unfortunately, until Christ returns, we're probably going to see more and more of it. But here's the thing. As that has all unfolded, I've, I've seen different responses from Christians. The first response is one that I expected. I saw a lot of my brothers and sisters in Christ coming out on Facebook and social media and saying, look at this. Like, we need to be careful, brothers and sisters. We need to put checks and balances in place in our own lives. We need to guard our hearts and repent quickly because apart from the grace of God, so go I. Meaning, I could just as easily fall into this trap. I expected that response. But then this strange thing happened. This second response that I didn't anticipate started turning up all over my social media. My Christian peers started to respond to those first people, and they said, how dare you say that? How dare you minimize what those guys did, what those people did, by suggesting that you too could fall into that? People don't just slip into that kind of sin. How dare you? And that was a curious response. And as I read that again and again and again from people who ought to know better, I just wondered, does, does anyone read their Bible anymore? Like, what do you mean people don't just slip into that kind of sin? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. If we are not capable, or if we are not careful, all of us here are capable of horrible things. Slowly and steadily we progress into ruin. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy here. He's saying, as you head into this assignment, Timothy, you look at these men. You look at Hymenaeus over there. You look at Alexander over there. They didn't set out to be heretics, Timothy. Day by day, slowly and steadily, they compromised. People don't, people don't set out to be serial adulterers. People don't set out to be stealing money from their church on a weekly basis. They don't just roll out of bed one day and say, this is what I'm going to do. No, how does that happen? Slow and steadily, they make peace with sin. They, they compromise here. They slide into sin here. They, they just ignore that alarm for long enough that their conscience is fine here, and then they go a step further. That is the pattern. And so Paul looks at Timothy and he says, don't, don't for a second think that you're immune, young man. You're in a spiritual battle. So you hold on tight to your faith and you hold on tight to a good conscience or you're going to find yourself shipwrecked right next to them, Timothy. That's true for pastors. That is true for parents. That is true for mentors. That's true for all of us. You're in a spiritual battle. There's an enemy that wants to take you down. There's a spiritual enemy that wants to take your family down. Remember who sent you. Right? Remember who gives you your marching orders. Remember who you listen to. Guard your belief and your behavior. Don't assume that you're immune. Prepare well. That's what he's saying in this text to young Timothy and by extension to us. And now having considered the text, before we conclude, I do want to pull out two implications in particular Meaning, in light of what we've just seen, I want to take out two truths from the text that we can apply to our lives today. The first is this, and I, please hear this loud and clear. Hard talks are better than hard falls. I'll go ahead and put my cards on the table. I hate hard talks. I hate them. I know we all hate hard talks, but I just feel like I hate them more than you. I, <laughs> you can't possibly hate them. 
Everything inside of me wants to avoid them. If God told me right now that I'll never have to have another hard talk in my life, I would learn how to do a cartwheel, and I would cartwheel all around this gymnasium. They are the reason, for real, why my hair is turning gray so much faster than all my friends. They're the reason why I developed a weird stress-related eye twitch in 2020. Hard talks stink, but they pale in comparison to weeping at your friend's funeral while you kick yourself for being too cowardly to talk to him about the sin he made peace with. Hard talks stink, but they pale in comparison to watching this denomination of 340 churches make peace with sin and run headlock into ruin. Hard talks stink, but they pale in comparison to the heartbroken kids who watch as mom and dad, faithful members of a happy church, finalize their divorce after years of growing apart without anyone in the church caring enough to speak up. Hard talks stink, but hard falls are so much worse. And evangelism in our culture has become significantly more challenging because 90% of the community out there is hardened to the gospel because they've witnessed a hard fall. They've been hurt by a hard fall, a hard fall that could have been avoided if somebody in the church would have had a hard talk. So let's have the hard talks in here before we do any more damage out there. You see a marriage in crisis? Talk to them. Pray for them. You see a kid letting go of the faith, wandering into the world? You see a pastor untethering from the text? Do you see a pattern of gossip or anger or bitterness or self-righteousness? Do you see a hard fall on the horizon? Then say something. In love, with an aim towards restoration, wage the good warfare. Have the hard talks. That's the first implication I think we can pull fairly from the text. But second and finally, we need to see this morning that ignoring your conscience will shipwreck your faith. You could argue we've already said that, but I think we need to press this in closer because this is so urgent. Look closely at verse 19. It tells them, holding, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Now, if you look closely at the grammar, you can see it in English, you can see it in Greek. He doesn't use the plural, these. He could have by holding fast to these things I just mentioned. But instead he says, by holding fast to this, which is a good conscience, the last thing he mentioned. Hymenaeus and Alexander shipwrecked their faith. This issue in Ephesus, this issue with these men, it came about because they let go of a good conscience. John Calvin wrote, a bad conscience is therefore the mother of all heresies. See, we often talk about how bad theology leads to bad behavior. And that's true, of course. If you believe bad, unhelpful things, you're going to give yourself permission to live in bad, unhelpful ways. What we don't often talk about, but what is equally true, is that bad behavior can also lead to bad belief. It is often the case that we want to do a thing, and so we do a thing. But then we feel bad about the thing, and so we need to change the way that we view the world. We need to change what we believe so that we can keep doing what we want to do. That is just as often true as the other one. And that's what seems to be the case here. What Paul is warning about. One commentator notes, more often than we know, religious error has its roots in moral rather than in intellectual causes. Meaning they didn't come to this conclusion by studying their Bible or reading a theology textbook. They came to this conclusion because of what they wanted to do. This means if you make peace with sin, if you decide to indulge in or turn a blind eye to or endorse something that you know is wrong, then you will most certainly seek out a new hermeneutic. That's a fancy word for saying a new way of studying the Bible to justify your behavior. And speaking of hard talks, I so badly didn't want to use this example, but I think I would be pastorally negligent if I didn't because I, I was thinking about how does this affect us? How do we need to hear this? And I was overwhelmed by the fact that over the next 10 years, this is going to be, I would imagine, the most challenging thing we're going to face as Christians here in Canada. Over the next 10 years, we are going to see churches across our country reinterpreting the Bible with regard to the issue of homosexuality. And I want to say before I go a step further that God calls us to love the LGBTQ plus community. Every single person is made in the image of God, should be treated with dignity and love and respect. And the church and myself have failed in this respect too many times. 
we can and we must do a much better job of resembling Jesus to this community. But if we would resemble Jesus, then our love and compassion must also come with the truth. And as we were reminded this morning, the gospel is good news for everyone. I I was having lunch with a couple last week and they reminded me of this. The gospel is good news for everyone. Do you believe that? It's good news for everyone. Now, the gospel necessarily comes with the truth about sin. You can't separate the two. But that's okay, because as as difficult as that is, the gospel is good news for everyone, including same-sex attracted people. It is good news that should be shared. And you ask, well, why then are you highlighting this one sin in particular today? And I want you to know, it's not because it it stands in distinction from the rest. It's not because I have a bone to pick. It really isn't. I'm highlighting this issue because I, I earnestly believe this is where the rubber will meet the road. It's where we will face, as a people, the greatest temptation to ignore our conscience. Because over the next 10 years, when our loved ones, our children, our, our siblings, our cousins come to us and they, and they look us in the eye and they say, how could you possibly say that this is sin? Everything inside of us, motivated by love, motivated by empathy, everything inside of us is going to want to let go of what the Bible says and to move into maximum affirmation and celebration. That's where we're going to want to go so badly. But then we're going to wake up the next morning and that alarm of our conscience is going to be going off. And we're going to want to turn off that alarm because you don't want an alarm of your conscience going off in your head. But we're not going to want to risk this relationship. We're not going to want to risk offense. And so what we'll need to do then is we'll need to find a way to read the Bible in such a way that we can, so we can ignore all of those difficult passages that speak to homosexuality. And that's what we'll do. And that's what we are doing in our country. The, the books are already written. You could, you could find them. You can go to Amazon and find four of them today. I believe in the next 10 years, I'm not a prophet, but I believe 80% of the churches in Aurelia will be reading their Bible this way. And you say, 80% seems extreme. Well, consider this as we're having hard talks. The majority of churches in Canada have already adopted this hermeneutic, this approach to the Bible. They just haven't applied it to this particular issue yet. For example, in a few weeks, we're working through 1 Timothy, so if you are a diligent student, you probably read ahead you know that in a few weeks we're going to come to the difficult topic of gender roles in the church. And as we come to those Sundays, I'm already feeling a little nervous, but I'm going to treat them the same way we would any Sunday. I'm going to, I'm going to read the text, and I'm going to explain the text, and I'm going to apply the text, just like any other normal Sunday. But it won't feel like a normal Sunday. It will feel awkward. It will feel offensive. Why is that? Well, it's because 80% of the Christians in Canada have already found a way of of reading that text, but of doing the opposite of what it says. And they found an approach to the Bible that allows them to do that. Now, to be clear, I'm not in any way suggesting that these two issues are the same. They're not the same. My grandmother was a preacher, and she's a wonderful, godly woman who God used, and she's in heaven today. I don't doubt that for a second. They're not the same issue. What I'm saying is the method, the approach to the scriptures is the same. The door that we open to get here is the door that we have to pass through to get here. And I'm not the only one who sees that. In 2015, a journalist from GQ, I don't read GQ. I don't know know how I have this article. We can talk later. Spent months attending Hillsong Church in New York. This was before the scandal. This is when uh, Justin Bieber was joining the church and they were baptizing Kevin Durant in some enormous tub. And... uh, she was with this church for six months. She'd grown to love this church. In fact, she found herself really compelled by Christ. She, but she said she couldn't get past their teaching on sexuality. And here's what she writes about the way that they approach the Bible. Here was her frustration. She wrote this. If you can back down from your doctrine of biblical inerrancy in order to let women pastor at Hillsong, because the Bible does clearly say that women shouldn't, then surely you could blur your eyes and see that Jesus never actually said anything about gays or abortion. And this lady off the street, in just a few short months, identified that the way that they had approached the Bible had already swung the door open for reinterpretation. If you can permit yourself to do the opposite of what the Bible says here, why can't you do it here? If you can use the argument here that the culture was very different and there was a difficult Greek word and Jesus didn't explicitly address this, 
do the exact same thing over here. Squint your eyes. You squinted your eyes when it was good for you. Now squint your eyes when it's good for this community. And she said that earnestly. And she's not wrong. For that reason, I believe we're 10 years away from a very different church in Canada. And actually, I think my estimation is probably too generous. The neighbors will applaud it as progress. Any church that dares to say, well, that's not what the Bible says, will be looked at like we've got four heads. We'll face the same kind of resistance that our brothers and sisters are facing in Newfoundland right now. And just to be clear, we've prayed for the, our church partners in Newfoundland so many weeks in a row, and maybe you don't know what's happening. You realize they've been kicked out of their rental facilities. Why are there protests? Why is there a hate group online that's over 2,000 people large? Why did that happen? Because somebody went to their statement of faith and they read what it said about sexuality and marriage. And it said that marriage is, is for a man and a woman. And it said that sex is to be engaged within a marriage. That's what our statement of faith says, to be clear. And they've been kicked out of all their rental facilities. On top of that, you can go to this page and you can see what the group is doing. This group has reached out to the United Church in Newfoundland and they have said, we want to hear from you, Church in Newfoundland, that you will not rent any of your facilities to this group. And the United Church in Newfoundland wrote back and said, we wouldn't dare. We don't read the Bible that way. So this, this isn't a hypothetical, weird solution. This is today, right next door in Newfoundland. It was hard to be a Christian in Ephesus. It was hard to be a Christian in Rome. It is hard to be a Christian in Newfoundland. It will be hard to be a Christian in Aurelia. That's the truth. But hear this as we conclude. That's what we signed up for. That's what we signed up for. We're shining the light of Jesus. And let's make sure we're shining it, all right? So hear all of that, but now let's put that away. Don't let that make you grumpy or, or, or suspicious. No, just make, that, make yourself courageous to shine the light of the gospel. We need to shine the light in the dark. We're proclaiming with the Apostle Paul that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. It is good news. It is good news for everyone. But there is a spiritual enemy who does not want that good news going forth. And we need to wake up to that reality quickly. We need to pray urgently. There is a spiritual enemy who wants to make that good news sound like bad news. There's a spiritual enemy that's going to be whispering in our ears, saying, did God really say there's going to be a spiritual enemy trying to convince us to soften off all the sharp edges. There's a spiritual enemy who doesn't want to see that community or that community or anybody in this community come to know the salvation that is ours in Christ. And he's going to do whatever he can to make us close our mouths. And we won't hear sweet testimonies like what we just heard from Jason. We won't hear those if we shut our mouths. You are engaged in a spiritual battle and lives are at stake. If we are afraid to tell people the truth about their sins, then we murder their souls. So hold fast. That's what our text is saying. That's what it was saying to Timothy. That's what it says to us today. Hold fast to the faith. Don't give an inch to novelty and myth and speculation. We preach Christ and him crucified. There is a God who loves us. And even though we have sinned and fallen short, God has put a plan in place to save sinners. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bear our sin on the cross, to bear whatever sin you bear with you, whether it's the sin of homosexuality or the sin of pride, whether it's drug addiction, whether it's pornography, whether it's your hypocrisy, whether it's your lying, whether it's your slander, your gossip, your bad parenting. He bears our sin on the cross, and we don't have to bear it any longer. That's the good news of the gospel. Hold on to that and preach it with all your worth. Hold fast to a clean conscience, church. Don't compromise. And listen, we've talked about this issue, but don't compromise. Stop watching filth on Netflix and numbing your conscience to sin. Stop indulging in things that you'd be ashamed of if anybody else knew. Stop ignoring that alarm that's been ringing in your heart. Look at those who have shipwrecked their faith. Are we immune? Can we play with sin and walk away unscathed? And as you hold on to faith and a good conscience, have the hard talks. Because it's going to be hard. And we're going to need people around us who love us enough to speak the truth. There's going to be things I don't see in my life. There's going to be things you don't see in your life. We celebrate a Remembrance Day. If somebody was climbing up over the trench and he didn't have his helmet on, any good brother would rip him down and say, put your helmet on your head. Well, we're in a spiritual fight. And there are a whole bunch of people climbing over the trench with no armor on. Rip them down, have the hard talk, because there's too much at stake. I believe we have a tremendous opportunity. Hear this. We have a tremendous opportunity in the years to come. Not easy, 
But I think it's going to be good. In the years to come, we get to declare to the watching world that God's way is right. In a world of confusion, in a world that is not heading in a good trajectory, we get to say, there is a way that leads to life. God will bless us as we hold fast to him. He'll use us in unexpected ways. I earnestly believe that. I believe it, but I don't take it for granted. I see the United Church and the YMCA started well with good intentions. I see Ravi Zacharias. I see Mark Driscoll. I see Hymenaeus. I see Alexander. And there but for the grace of God go I. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh, I just pray you'd help. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Spirit, we would hear what we ought to hear and that you would just wipe away all the noise. Lord, I know I'm just... I'm just a man, and as I stand up to proclaim, I know that your word has authority and power, and it changes hearts and lives. And Lord, I am so reminded that my word has no such promise. All of my thoughts, all my opinions, Lord, they have no power to save. And God, I pray that anything I've said that's unhelpful would just fall to the floor. And I thank you that by the power of your spirit, your truth will go forth. Lord, so preach a better sermon now to the hearts and minds of your people than I could ever preach. And Lord, help us to live for you. Lord, help us to love like you love. I, I do pray, God, that you press that into us. Lord, that we, would, that we would have hard talks, but not because we're zealous and want to make people miserable, but because we absolutely love the world, the world that you made, the world that you sent your son to save. I pray that we would be a people who just go forth to everyone, who would look to any person in this city with eyes full of compassion and mercy, and that we would declare with humility from one sinner to another, and just say, there is a God who came to rescue you from sin. Lord, let that be our song. Let that be our story. Uh, Use us in any way you see fit. Lord, and I pray that you would just humble us enough to know that we can't take any of this for granted. We need your grace, your strength. We need to look to your word. We need to hold fast to faith, a good conscience. We need that every day. Lord, so I pray that you'd guard your people. Lord, I think of the 50 kids in those classrooms right now who are hearing the gospel who are going to go through an education system and who are going to grow up in a world that's very different than the one we grew up in. And I thank you that you are powerful to guard hearts and to teach them and instruct them in the truth. And I pray, God, that you see fit to use us as parents and mentors and aunts and uncles in the faith to model in a way that is compelling, to speak in a way that is full of grace and truth. God, that you would would save every one of those 50 kids. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' saving name. And everyone said, Amen. Worship team, would you lead us?